Good evening and welcome to the Lupus Foundation of America Chapter Network's Let's Talk About It webinar. Each month, our Chapter Network presents webinars on important topics related to lupus from experts across the country. Tonight, we will be discussing lupus and disparities. My name is Leslie Viscara Tierney. I'm the Vice President of Operations and Patient Navigator of the Lupus Foundation of America, Greater Ohio Chapter. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping reminders and announcements. I want to remind you that the information provided in this webinar is for general information and educational purposes only and is not substitute for your physician's advice. The views expressed by our webinar presenters are those of the presenters and not necessarily those of the Lupus Foundation of America. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat section and our presenter will try to answer as many questions as possible. If you have further questions or want to learn more about upcoming education programs, support groups, or events in your area, please reach out to your local chapter. As I mentioned before, I represent the Greater Ohio Chapter of the Lupus Foundation of America. This month's Let's Talk About It webinar is an important topic to share. Our chapter wanted the opportunity to part with, partner with our chapter networks so that we can all be educated together. On behalf of the Lupus Foundation of America Greater Ohio Chapter, I would like to thank the Ohio Commission on Minority Health. Partial funding for this program is provided by the Ohio Commission on Minority Health and an earmark from the state of Ohio and managed by the Department of Health by the Ohio Department of Health. After this webinar, please be sure to follow up with your local chapter, but for the Ohio residents, we will send out an evaluation to help our chapter. Please be sure to check your email in the morning and provide us with feedback. We want to hear from you. And that brings us to the evening's presenter, Dr. Arshira Blazer, MD, MSCI is an assistant attending physician and rheumatologist at HSS in New York City, an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. She received her medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine and completed her residency at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She went on to complete a rheumatology fellowship and a master of science at NYU, NYU, NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Blazer specializes in the treatment of all rheumatic diseases and is an expert in the treatment of SLE. She has recently, she has research interest in the interplay between genetic polymorphism, commonly found in African ancestry backgrounds, environmental and social stressors, and the SLE pathogenesis. Dr. Blazer has been recognized by the National Minority Quality Forum as the top 40 under 40 leader in minority health and is a recognized thought leader in lupus disparities. Dr. Blazer has served in leadership roles from American College of Rheumatology, Lupus Foundation of America, Lupus Research Alliance, Association of Women in Rheumatology, African League of Association for Rheumatology, and Lupus Nephritis Trial Networks. Thank you so much, Dr. Blazer, for joining us. I will now give you control. Um, uh, so thank you for having me and thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. And I am excited to talk to you guys about uh, this very important topic tonight. Uh, so it's, let's talk about it, racism, disparities, and lupus. So these are my disclosures. Okay, so what do we know about lupus incidence and prevalence in minority groups? So overall, we know that the adjusted prevalence rate of lupus is the highest in non-white population. So these are data from the uh, recent five CDC registries, which span the United States. So uh, looked across Georgia, Michigan, California, New York, and the Indian Health Survey. And um, the authors were able to estimate the regional prevalence of lupus per 100,000. And so you can see the overall rate in the bar graphs to the left 
Um, but when you look at non-white populations, so Black, Asian Pacific Islander, Hispanic, and American Indian, um, you can see that the incidence rates are, are much higher. And in fact, for African-Americans, they're about three times higher. So it's actually not just the case that incidence and prevalence are higher, it's also the case that morbidity mortality tends to be higher in minority groups. So this is a study that was published in 2018 in arthritis and rheumatology. And what the authors did was they looked at all cause mortality for women across the United States. And they excluded things like accidental deaths or violent deaths to look for deaths due to chronic disease. And as you can see for all women, um, lupus is the number seven cause of death in ages 15 to 24, but it drops out of that top 10 in the older age group, so 25 to 34 and 35 to 44. Now, when you look at African-American women and Hispanic women, lupus actually stays in that top 10 cause of death through to the fourth decade of life. So we see that morbidity and mortality really is different in minority groups. Now, one of my really great friends, uh, Titulola Falasinu, who is a PhD out of uh, Stanford, this is study based on the model of eight Americas found by, uh, founded by a Harvard group, Murray et al. And the point of this was to characterize jointly the uh, socioeconomic risk of disease by socioeconomic status and also geographic location. And so she adopted these different groups so that she could take a look at how lupus stacked up. And so this is, these are the definitions of the eight Americas by decreasing to increasing health disadvantage. And so you can see Asian two, three, and four are all groups of uh, white individuals. So Northland, low income, rural, middle America or low income and Appalachia. Five was Western Native American, uh, six, seven, and eight were African American groups. And so you can see here that the mortality rate ratio for each of these groups, rural, urban, rich or poor, tended to be higher for African-Americans. So groups six, seven, and eight, regardless of socioeconomic status, had about a threefold increased risk of mortality due to lupus. So, you know, when we have these discussions, I wanna be able to frame what race is and what it's not, and be able to understand what racism is and how it impacts um, outcomes in disease, including lupus. And in the second part, we'll have uh, an idea of this framework and we'll take a look at some of the trends that we see in lupus and how these factors inf influence the outcomes that we see. Okay, so the first point that I wanna make very, very clear is that race is not genetically discrete, reliably measured, or biologically meaningful. So most humans are exactly the same um, on average. Human populations are on average very, very similar genetically. So we are 99.9% .9 genetically the same as a human race. So a series of population level migrations produced a small proportion of uh, ancestral variation across the continent. So imagine that this first population is the population of humans who originated in Africa. Say these colored dots represent different genetic variants that are a part of these, uh, these individuals. And this group decided to migrate out um, of Africa. And you can see that the proportion of genetic variants is a little bit different in this group than the, the parent group, but that these genetic variants were really all represented in the original population. So we get this, this population expands, maybe migrates more, and you have a little bit of genetic variation and so on and so on. So it's also important to understand that genetic distribution in a population is random. So we all carry our, our genetic uh, contributions and we meet randomly. And so there's no way to ensure that certain genetic uh, variations or certain genetic variants end up in certain groups and that's actually doesn't uh, track by race. So most human traits are very complex and they're related to multiple genes and multiple environmental factors. 
And ancestry is different than race because ancestry is a process based on the concept of geographic history. Where did your ancestors evolve? Whereas race is a taxonomy based on um, patterns of uh, phenotypic traits. So things that we can see on the outside and use to categorize people. Okay, so to drive this point home, um, I use my friend who is a rheumatologist and brilliant scientist, Christina Lanata. So she is uh, from Lima, Peru, and her ancestry is Italian and Spanish. She lives in San Francisco. So what is her race and ethnicity? Well, it turns out it depends on where she is. So when she goes to Europe, she is Southern European. When she goes to Lima, Peru, she is white. When she's here in the US, she's Hispanic. So you can see that a lot of these characterizations have more to do with uh, our societies than they have to do with anything based in biology. Okay, but we do see differences in outcomes and also um, in um, medical expression by race. So what are we measuring? So when we measure racial differences in medicine, we are largely measuring the effects of racism. So race becomes biology because racism affects large swaths of the population and those individuals end up experiencing disparities and differences in health. Okay, so how is it that we hold on to these racial concepts, even if they don't necessarily uh, make scientific sense? So in this talk, we're going to talk about a little bit of history and a little bit of sociology. So one of uh, the premier sociologists who study race relations in the Americas is um, Charles Mills. And he describes the preservation of the racial order as a kind of gaslighting, right? Um, so he names this the epistemology of ignorance in his landmark publication, The Racial Contract. So, you know, in his words, he says, one has to learn to see the world wrongly, but with the assurance that the set of mistaken perceptions will be validated by white epistemic authority. To a significant extent then, white signatories to the racial construct will live in an invented delusional world, a racial fantasy land, a consensual hallucination. One could say then that a gen as a general rule, that white misunderstanding, misrepresentation, evasion and self-deception on matters related to race are among the most pervasive mental phenomenon of the past few hundred years. A cognitive and moral economy psychically required for conquest, colonial, uh, colonization and enslavement. So those are very strong words, but essentially what he's saying is that in order to preserve this, uh, this order, we have to have four components. We have to have a power differential, an interest differential, a willful ignorance and a reality that we are ignoring. Okay, so let's talk about all these components um, with regard to racism and then we will, we will see how this affects health. So the power differential um, at the turn of, or at the, the uh, forefront of American society was that the racial caste system needed to be created in order to justify slavery, subjugation, and native genocide. So race was originally created as a social caste system meant to define the categories of populations that were interacting in the Americas in the 1700s. So, um, so you can see that the least social capital uh, were Africans who were in fact not considered full humans. Um, and then there were Native Americans and then European Americans had the most social capital. So the theory of race requires that racial groups are biologically discrete as evidenced by physical characteristics. So this rooting race in biology really is a part of maintaining this racial caste system. So races were thought to be naturally unequal and therefore must be ranked hierarchically. So there's no equality in the concept of race. And each race has distinctive cultural behaviors linked again to their biology. Differences among races were thought to be profound and unalterable. So the interest differential became the greatest when um, abolitionists started to raise their voices. So when there was this movement to start to um, abolish slavery in the US, 
um, there became this big interest in, in legitimizing slavery. So when in Thomas Jefferson's book, Notes on the State of Virginia, he describes this. So he speculates on the nature of the Negro. Um, and these are the terms that he uses. Of course, we wouldn't use these terms now. But he suggests that there was a natural inferiority calling on the scientific community to prove his speculation as a justification for slavery. So he writes, in general, their existence appears to participate more of a sensation than reflection. In imagination, they are dull and tasteless. This unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. And so what did he do? Well, he called on medicine. So he called on Samuel Cartwright, um, who in 1851 wrote this seminal publication on the biology, the biologic differences across the races. So Cartwright was an antebellum physician in the South. You can actually still find this. It was published in the New Orleans uh, Medical and Surgical Journal. So you can read through the whole thing, which I do not recommend. I did for this talk, it was, it was not pleasurable. Um, but in any case, um, so he was widely revered at the time. He trained at University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League School. He was a surgeon under Andrew Jackson. And um, he was the one who led the charge uh, called on by the Medical Association of Louisiana to be able to provide scientific support for the racial caste system. Now, I want to draw your attention to this because we think that this is all ancient history. But in fact, these are things that become embedded in the fabric of medicine and affect the way we even think today. So on the left, I'll have Cartwright statements. On the right, I'll have publications that came out in contemporary science. So on the left, Cartwright wrote, his brain is a ninth or 10th less than in other races of men conjoined with a deficiency of cerebral matter in the cranium and an excess of nervous matter distributed to the organs of sensation and assimilation. That is the true cause of that debasement of mind, which has rendered the people of Africa unable to take care of themselves. So he's saying there is no way for people to be in, black people to be emancipated because they're just unable to take care of themselves because they're just, they don't have the intellectual capacity. So on the right side, contemporary science. So this is a publication that came out August 28th, 2019. And in, in this article, it's, it's called Global Ancestry and Cognitive Ability. And what the, the authors were trying to prove was that if a person had more genetic admixture from African people above and beyond socioeconomic status, that person had less IQ, so less um, intellectual capacity. And of course, we know this not to be true. Okay, what about this publication um, that was very controversial? So this came out in, in the Journal of Science, extremely um, uh, prestigious journal, and it was eventually redacted. But here, the authors were trying to figure out whether or not this gene called microcephalin um, was related to differences in brain size across people of different continental ancestry. And so the pie charts are showing there's the proportion of people who have the polymorphism that uh, associates with lower brains, uh, smaller brain size. And the black part of the pie chart are people with the polymorphisms associated with larger brain size. And you can see that the authors concluded that across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, this polymorphism associated with lower brain size was more prevalent. Again, this ended up having to be redacted, um, but this is something that still comes out in the medical literature. Okay, so Cartwright wrote, they resemble children and like them, they fear the rod. They are very easily governed by love combined with fear and are ungovernable, vicious and rude under any form of government, not resting on love and fear as a basis. So this is on the right, a paper that came out in 2012, and it's called Do Pigmentation and Mel of the Melanocortin System Modulate Aggression and Sexuality in Humans as They Do in Other Mammals? So what the authors were trying to prove was that having more melanin, having more skin pigmentation associated with more sexually aggressive and also um, physically aggressive behavior, again, coming from this lexicon. Okay, and this is one that is actually 
one of the most troubling to me. So I pulled a number of these quotes from Samuel Cartwright, and then we'll go over to the study on the right. So Cartwright says, idleness is the most prolific cause of dysesthesia. So Cartwright thought that African Americans didn't feel pain the same way. So he's saying, deprived of oxygen, the blood becomes unfit to stimulate the brain uh, to energy and unfit to stimulate nerves, causing insensibility of sensation distributed to the skin. He says they are difficult to bleed owing to the smallness of their veins. His brain is a ninth or 10th less than the other races. Their skin is dry, thick, and harsh to the touch. Although the nose is flat and the terminate bones are more developed, causing a sensation of smell to be more acute. One of the most formidable complaints among Negroes is pulmonary congestion, the Negro's lungs, except when the, uh, the body is warmed by exercise. So he thought that forced work through slavery was actually good for African-Americans because otherwise they would have pulmonary congestion. Um, they're very sensitive to cold air. So on the right, this is a publication that came out in PNAS in 2016. And what the authors did was they surveyed 92 individuals who self uh, identified as white. Um, and they asked them whether or not they thought there were real differences between uh, black and white people. Now these are physicians in training. So these are all residents who are practicing physicians presumably now, right? Um, and so when they asked, are blacks nerve endings less sensitive than whites? 20% thought that this was true. When they asked if black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites, 39% thought that that was true. Whites have larger brains than blacks. 12% thought this was true. Black skin is thicker than whites. 58% thought that that was true. Blacks have a more sensitive sense of smell than whites. 20% thought that was true. Whites have more efficient respiratory systems than blacks. 16% thought this was true. So I point this out because you know, history is really living. All of these aspects that had been, become legitimized by medical science actually stay in the ways that people think about the different races and including physicians who are treating um, patients of different backgrounds. Okay, so if you're reading this and you're thinking, how did any of this get published in the first place? Well, we have to take a look at who is in charge of publications of what gets out in the medical literature. And it turns out that premier journal editors lack diversity as well. So, you know, our medical journals are really the gatekeepers um, as you know, for what gets out into the public, what becomes um, accepted in science, what ends up filtering through medical textbooks, and then what we learn in medicine. And it turns out that if you stratify over 7,000 journals um, by editors, race and ethnicity, only 2% of those journal editors are black. And here on the left-hand side, using JAMA Network as an example, you can see that uh, as the, the um, seniority and authority of the gen journal editor goes up, so the top editors are on the, on the top, the assistant section is on the bottom, it actually becomes more white. So top editors are by far and away um, uh, self-identifying as white with some having identified as Asian. And there are actually no um, Latino or uh, African-American editors above the associate editor um, position. So, you know, we really have to be able to get more voices in uh, what we decide gets out into medical literature so that we understand um, differences in the kinds of things that we need to be studying. Okay, and so this is just a map showing um, that not only are the editors more likely to be of a certain race, but the same people are sitting on the editorial boards of multiple journals. So this plot here, you can see the circles on the outside represent a single journal. And there are the different um, specialties shown labeled here. And you can see that the size of the dot is associated with the um, diversity index and then the H index, meaning how, how hard hitting or how prestigious a journal is, is shown in the colors. So you can see that these lines represent a person who is sitting on the, the editorial board of multiple journals. And this makes a very dense web. So it's not just that these people are ethnically homogenous, but that these same people 
are sitting on multiple journals and um, making decisions about what gets out. They're really the gatekeepers. Okay, so let's talk about the willful ignorance. So we as a medical profession greatly resist the concept that systemic racism causes health inequality. So let's define systemic racism for a moment. So it's the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination via mutually reinforcing inequitable systems. So in housing, education, employment, healthcare, criminal justice, et cetera, that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources uh, reflected in historically, uh, in history, culture, and interconnected institutions. So the study that I'm showing here, so this is showing uh, that, that authors try to retrieve searches in the medical literature for health, disease, medicine, or public health, along with one of the search terms across the x-axis, right? And so when the authors searched for these terms along with race, they got back almost 50,000 publications. But when they search the same terms with racial discrimination, there is only 4% of the number. So only 2,000 publications came back. If they search with racism, similarly, about 4%. And when they searched for systemic racism, 0.4% or only 195 articles came back. So even though it's very clear that racism is a major determinant of the social determinants of health, which we'll discuss, um, we as a medical society are very resistant to studying this and talking about it head on. Okay, so what do I mean by racism is a major determinant of the social determinants of health? So we hear all the time that 80% of health outcomes are due to socioeconomic factors or other social determinants of health. So either, you know, education, job attainment, family support income, uh, the, your physical environment, your health behaviors, such as smoking or drinking alcohol, sexual behaviors, things like that. And only 20% of health outcomes are actually due to health care. What we don't mention is that racism greatly determines the social determinants of health. So on the right, this is a table adapted from Bradley et al. This is a 2017 survey um, looking at median uh, household asset, assets, so wealth as measured by median household assets, poverty, so proportion living below the poverty line, unemployment rate, incarceration rate, proportion with no health insurance, infant mortality, potential life costs, and life expectancy. So the highest number across the racial groups is shown in uh, green, and the lowest numbers are shown in red. And you can see for each of these indices, um, white and Asian people in American society tend to be on the highest end, whereas uh, Black and Native Americans tend to be at the lowest end. And so you can see this racial caste system still persists. These are the same groups of people who were interacting in the Americas um, during and before slavery. And so these are the kinds of things that, that stay in our society. So looking a little bit deeper at how neighborhood segregation and the legacy of redlining impacts health outcomes. So for your understanding, so under the New Deal, National Housing Act created this FHA, um, which regulated mortgage terms, expanding the middle class to home ownership. This on the right is a map of Minneapolis as an example. So there's, there's this underwriting uh, manual that made racial and social homogeny one of a homeowner's neighborhood um, factors that was explicit for its appraisal. So the residential security maps were mapped as best shown in green on the map here, where mortgage rates were good and lenders were available to give funds. And this was about, about 75 to 80% of the appraisal. Still desirable were shown in blue. So these were neighborhoods where good mortgage lenders would have a tendency to hold commitments. Definitely declining shown in yellow. And these were uh, characterized by obsolescence and infiltration of lower grade populations. So good mortgage, mortgage lenders were conservative in these areas. And then hazardous. So these are characterized by detrimental influences in pronounced degree, undesirable population or the infiltration of it. So lenders should refuse to make loans in these areas. Now, 
If you look at the map and you look at the proportion of the black population in Minneapolis, and this is from 2018, you can see that the black population falls very heavily in these um, hazardous and definitely declining areas. Now, if you take a look at red line neighborhoods today, you see that the life expectancy differential is there in every major US city. And in fact, these um, differentials can be upwards of 15 years. So the life expectancy is 15 years lower in these hazardous neighborhoods compared to the best neighborhoods. So I'm just gonna let you scroll through this. You can see some cities do better than others, but in every single city, life expectancy is lower in these hazardous neighborhoods. So, you know, again, this suggests that there is this very oppressive effect of um, segregation, structural racism on health outcomes, including for lupus. So let's just put this all together. So when we think about a, a deeper conceptual look of racial health disparities in medicine, we see that there's a power differential. So resources, access, social political power are all concentrated in white populations and minorities experience a lack of resources, access and social political power to make meaningful change. There's an, if, there's an interest differential. So for white society, it's to preserve the racial status quo where they enjoy um, quite a bit of privilege. The minority population is to achieve health and otherwise equity and self-actualization. The reality is that minorities experience several disparities in housing, education, upward social mobility, and of course, health. And the willful ignorance is racism doesn't exist and minority suffering as a result of inherent biological differences. This was the Jim Crow brand of racism or that socioeconomic factors that no one can change are causing these differences. And this is colorblind racism, which we will talk about. So the minority uh, reaction is confusion, fear, questioning one's own reality and ultimately submission. So we talk a lot about minority mistrust, but we have to really understand the full landscape and what produces that if, when, we, when we talk about those concepts. Okay, so part two, how structural racism contributes to lupus disparities. So we know that we all experience the world through our own culture, and this impacts research and care. So you've got your person, they're wrapped in a family, a community, a social, cultural, economic, and political uh, framework. And this uh, all influences healthcare, mental health and behavioral care, education, employment, housing, transportation, uh, and faith, religion, and community. So it turns out that academic medical school faculty demographics do not reflect patient demographics. So patients of minority background are often not culturally congruent with their physicians. So this is data from 2018, race and ethnicity of, um, of physicians. And you can see that 56% identified as white, um, about 17% identified as Asian, 13% uh, were unknown, but when you look at these underrepresented in medicine, so about 5% identified as Black or African American, um, Hispanic was about, again, 5.8%. We look at Native American, it's 1%, right? So there are a lot of these groups who are most affected by lupus who are not represented. So how do we do in rheumatology? So in a 2015 ACR Rheumatology Healthcare Workforce Survey, um, about 2,000 rheumatologists were surveyed, and what was found was that Black rheumatologists represent, represented 1% of those who answered, and Hispanic rheumatologists only 4%. So again, we are not very diverse, and that affects the way that our patients are able to interact with us. So when we think about healthcare disparities, this is where our living history meets structural racism. And we hear quite a bit about medical mistrust in these historic events like Tuskegee and the CIA funded LSD experiments, um, South Dakota vaccine tests, and all of these things did happen and they were tragic. But what we get in our everyday life is that patients experience persistent discrimination and that this leads to psychological and um, psycho psychosocial stress. Um, this is compounded by clinician implicit bias, especially since we know that our clinicians tend not to hail for the same groups as our patients. And this can impact disparities in clinical decision-making and also in com clinical communication. 
Ultimately, this culminates in negative patient reactions, racial healthcare disparities, um, and worsens the problem. Okay, so this is a great article that came out in 2020. And uh, this included Ros, Ros Ramsey Goldman and Candace Feldman, who are thought leaders in this area. And what they did was they used critical race theory to understand trial participation among black individuals with lupus. And so this is a qualitative research study, which I think is really important because often we do these quantitative studies, we get the data, we get the numbers, and then we sort of impose why we think that trend happened. Whereas this really uh, had focus groups where people were actually asked what they were thinking. And so in this group, they found that racism was a major reason for mistrust of trial participation. So just reading some of these tropes, um, one patient says, but there is a deep mistrust with the African-American community. First thing a lot of us think of is the Tuskegee experiment. So there's a deep distrust between the medical community and African-American community. And that's definitely a barrier. So this was a Chicago group. One other person says, we have had so much racism. We're thinking of all the things that have happened to us throughout the years. And we're going to say, oh, no, you all want to do uh, all that disease stuff and testing. No, we know where our, what our ancestors went through. It's a Boston group. Another says, a lot of times when you hear that statement, we're looking for Black people, our antennas go up. Is this racist or something like that? Again, a Boston group. Despite the fact that this is what's on our patients' minds, there are no studies in the literature addressing the um, limited minority participation in trials um, due to the uh, experience of racism. Okay, so it turns out that self-reporting experiential racism, so people who report that they experience racism in their um, medical encounters, associates with decreased health services utilization. So this is a meta-analysis of 70 studies reporting on the quantitative associations between self-reported experiencing of racism and health services utilization. And experience with racism associated with negative patient experiences, um, so at an odds ratio of 0.35, also delay in seeking healthcare, an odds ratio of 0.43. And this is very important. We'll talk about this shortly. Treatment uptake and adherence. We talk all the time about non-adherence. Some people call it non-compliance, but it turns out that patients who experience this are less likely to trust in the, um, in the care plan and less likely to take their medications. Okay. So several barriers uh, to lupus diagnosis may be compounded by structural racism. So we know that lupus has lots of symptom vari uh, variability. So no two lupus patients look alike. Uh, from patient to patient, you may have different symptoms that present over time. And in order to get a diagnosis, a physician has to listen to you, right? So there has to be a physician that says, I understand what you're saying. I'm putting this together with everything else that I've listened to. And I think that you may have lupus. I'm going to send you for an assessment. Now, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Just trying to mute uh, because I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Okay, all righty. So with lupus, the diagnostic criteria are variable and they're created for research. A physician diagnosis is a gold standard. So access to care, we know that lupus disproportionately affects uh, demographics with less access to healthcare and that patients of these demographics tend to be underinsured or uninsured, meaning they have to rely on more stressed healthcare systems. Co-presentation. Our autoimmune diseases may present in combinations. So lupus commonly overlaps with rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren syndrome, fibromyalgia, among others. Okay. So what do we know about time to diagnosis in, in ethnic minorities? So this is data from the UCSF CLUES cohort looking at 196 lupus patients. And they found that there was a longer time to lupus diagnosis associated with African-American or Asian race lower educational attainment, and lower socioeconomic status. Minorities tended to wait over one year to receive a diagnosis of lupus. And Asian and African-American lupus patients were less likely to see a specialist within three months. So even when the diagnosis was made, 
they were less likely to be referred to a rheumatologist within three months. So compared to 92% of European Americans, 64% of African Americans and 66% of Asian Americans were referred in the first three months. So does this matter for lupus outcomes? And it turns out, yes. So this is a study that is based on um, chart review. So what the authors did was they pulled lupus diagnosis in 4,000 patients who were either diagnosed early or late. And so they, they defined the index date as the time of first lupus diagnosis. And they went back at six month intervals up to 12 months to look for the first time there was an inkling or an idea that the person had lupus. So either that there were symptoms suggestive of lupus or an ANA test was sent and it was positive. And then they looked forward at the follow-up period for another year. And they found that with um, the, the group of patients who had late diagnosis defined as greater than six months from the time that they initially started showing some signs of having lupus were more likely to have any flares, but particularly more likely um, to have severe flares uh, of their disease. Now, the other thing to note here is that patients who were diagnosed early were exhibited fewer comorbidities. So those problems that go along with lupus than patients who were diagnosed late. And the biggest difference we see here is with lupus kidney disease. And we know that this is not only a harbinger of mor my morbidity mortality in lupus, but also that this is something that is much more common in minority populations. They also saw differences for congestive heart failure, stroke, myocardial infarction, hypertension, and so on. So it turns out that, again, renal disease is one of the major drivers of increased mortality in lupus. So this is a meta-analysis on the left showing the standardized mortality ratio for different um, uh, causes in lupus. And you can see that renal or kidney disease is the number one cause followed by infection. And also here on the right-hand side, you see survival curves. So the proportion of people who's, who have lupus and survive when they have no renal injury versus when they have renal injury. And so you can see that the survival over time, especially past five years, is much higher for people who don't have kidney injury. Okay, so what about the community, the care divide? So again, patients of minority uh, background tend to um, be relegated to healthcare systems that are more stressed or community care systems. And so it turns out that compared to academic systems, community care systems are less likely to screen for lupus nephritis. So this is a study again in the CLUES cohort, 148 patients looking at university clinic, county hospital clinic, um, uh, community staff model HMO or community other providers. And you can see that there's this very large statistically significant drop down in the screening for lupus nephritis as, as um, defined by getting a, a urinalysis, looking at the protein in the urine, understanding the creatinine or the kidney function, and then looking at disease activity by double stranded DNA and complements, as well as screening for blood pressure. Okay. So when we look at the comorbidities that patients have by race and ethnicity, so this is a study, uh, again, that came from UCSF, uh, taking a look at a FIWA. So what the authors basically did was they took about 1,000 lupus patients and they looked at their ICD-9 codes. So these are the codes in the medical chart that tell us what other problems these lupus patients have. And so they compared African Americans to European Americans and the level of significance. So anything above this line is significantly different between the two. Now, if you see an upside down triangle, it's more common in African Americans. If you see a right side up triangle, it's more common in European Americans. So despite the fact that African Americans were on average about 10 years younger, almost all of these triangles are upside down. And you see the biggest differences were for hypertension, renal disease, uh, heart failure. These are comorbidities that we see in patients who are diagnosed late. Okay. So getting into a little bit of colorblind racism and how this shows up in physician uh, uh, decision-making, I want to turn again to one of our sociology colleagues, Eduardo Bonilla-Silva. Uh, 
So he describes the new racism as racism without racists. So colorblind racism justifies minorities' contemporary status as a product of market dynamics like socioeconomic status, naturally occurring phenomenon, and imputed cultural limitations. So he defines four frames of colorblind racism. So there's ab abstract liberalism. So this is the abstract use of political or economic liberalism ideas to explain racial dynamics. So an example of this is uh, opposing affirmative action because it represents preferential treatment for minorities. Naturalization, so suggesting that natural phenomenon cause racial dynamics. So an example of this would be assuming segregation occurs because people of similar cultures naturally self-segregate. Cultural racism. So this is culturally based stereotyping to explain minority suffering. So assuming, uh, so again, so like assuming that drug non-adherence occurs because uh, certain cultural groups uh, oppose taking medication. What about minimizing racism? So this is suggesting that discrimination is no longer a central factor affecting minorities' life choices. So an example would be saying something like, uh, there's discrimination, but there are plenty of job opportunities. Okay, so we don't have a lot of these studies in lupus, but this is one that came out in JAMA, uh, open access, uh, and there are two studies here, one in 2019 and one in 2020. And so the objective here was to observe uh, physician decision-making with uh, regard to advanced heart failure therapies. So this uh, involves both objective and subjective criteria. So it's how well the heart is doing, how sick the patient is, and then also do we think the person has the support to be able to get this heart. So um, the study question was, does patient race or gender influence physician recommendation for a transplant, which is the best possible outcome, or an LVAD, which is sort of a stopgap to transplant. So um, 422 physicians across gender and race were upset, uh, assessed, uh, and patients' race and gender varied, but the clinical vignette stayed exactly the same. So the story was the same, but the, different, the pictures shown to the physician were different. So it turned out that the Black patient uh, was least likely to get the heart transplant at an odds ratio of negative 0.58. And when the patient was black and the physician was older, this was the, the circumstance under which the bias was the strongest. So the physician thought that the black men on average were, uh, was poor, of poorer baseline health, less adherent to his medications and less trustworthy. The black woman they thought was less socioeconomically stable and had less social support. And the white woman they thought um, that the spouse was an inadequate caregiver or the kids were a liability. So understanding, so this is again, a qualitative study. And what the authors did was they took um, phrases or vignettes from a physician when they asked them to describe their decision-making. So, just to point out that we are all steeped in the same culture, these ideas were prevalent across the race and ethnicity of the physician. So abstract liberalism it was one of the frames we discussed. So this physician says, if there isn't adequate social support and there's still a gray area, then I would be pushed a little more towards a VAD than a transplant. There's a limited number of organs, whereas VADs, there's no limitations on that. So we describe it as a precious resource, the heart. This is a white physician. Naturalization. Uh, this physician says, because she's African-American, it sounds like her socioeconomic status is not the greatest. One car, she's working, disability, those sorts of things make me think that she's probably not as socioeconomically stable as other patients, especially since she lacked health insurance a couple of times. This was a white physician. Cultural racism. Then the question is, does she have any support? If the grandkids are living with grandma, then it sounds like maybe the kids are unavailable. And that's how I would interpret that. So suggesting that if she's taking care of young children, they must not be hers, they must be her children. So she is strained by that. And also her children are not helping her. This was a minority physician who said this. Minimization of racism. Adherence, loss of follow-up for a couple of years uh, when he didn't have health insurance. Something's not fitting here. Is he lying to us? Was he not working for the Postal Service? The social worker will need to sort that out. Again, this was a minority physician. Okay, so how a, a um, provider communicates with a patient really matters. And it turns out that in lupus, 
hurried provider communication associates with slick damage accrual. So slick damage is a way that we measure how lupus and its treatments have scarred the bodies and the different systems over time. So the higher the damage index, the worse the outcome for these patients. So this is a single center cross-sectional study of provider communication and self-efficacy for medication management uh, and patient reported status across race and ethnicity. So 121 participants, 36% were white, 64% were African-American. And what they found, so this is all, all patients. So for all patients, hurried communication associated with more damage to the organs due to lupus at an odds ratio of 2.4. So about two and a half times more um, likely to accrue damage. It also associated with hypertension. Now, when you looked at the white patients, the effect of this was actually less. But when you looked at the black patients, the effect of this was, was um, more pronounced. So her communication greatly associated almost three times as much damage for the African-Americans compared to the white patients. Okay. And again, morbidity mortality is related to damage cruel and lupus. So we want all of our patients to present without any organ damage at all. And we know that patients who have organ damage at the time that they're diagnosed are more likely to go on to develop even more organ damage and are more likely to succumb to their disease. And this is particularly true for kidney disease and also uh, neuropsychiatric and brain disease. Okay, so what are the solutions here? We have to understand that this system was built purposefully. So purposely built structures must be purposely dismantled. I cannot tell you how many times that people say, oh, eventually our society will get less racist. We just have to wait for the older generations to die out. That would be like seeing a big building in the middle of downtown that's reinforced with concrete and steel and has a basement and just saying, we really needed to demolish that, but let's wait for erosion to take care of it. We have to have active solutions for this active problem. And we're starting to do this and we can build on current diversity and inclusion initiatives to understand how structural racism impacts our diseases. So there are a number of different initiatives. So there's the impact for lupus, which is a faith-based approach to awareness and participation in lupus clinical trials. The CDC funded five different studies and a lot of the information we're getting about disparities is actually coming from those cohorts across the nation. We also have a number of other interventions sponsored by the Lupus Research Alliance, uh, Alliance Lupus Therapeutics. Um, these are just some of the principal investigators who are leading the charge here. So Anka Askne, Sam Lim, Ross Ramsey Goldman. Um, so these are people who are intervening with um, various ways. So this one, the PALS intervention is actually a peer resource. So lupus patients are able to support each other and seeing how that impacts, impacts in, uh, outcomes for uh, different groups. So finally, reaching patients of all backgrounds requires a multi-layered approach. So we have to be able to say racism and we have to be able to study the problem. So we must understand the scope of the problem through both qualitative and quantitative research. We have to listen. So we have to educate ourselves as a physician body to understand the unique challenges that our patients face. So we can do this through focus groups like community partnerships, as we talked about, the lupus conversations. And this is um, spearheaded currently by Dr. Candace Feldman and Ross Ramsey Goldman, who are putting out quite a bit of research here. There are online platforms like the Empower Study uh, out of Oklahoma, OMRF, and this was uh, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Joan Merrill. We can educate, so we have to provide physicians and trainees with comprehensive education on cultural competence and bias. We have to undo that medical education that's been there so long in our, our lexicon. So Dr. Irene Blanco uh, is really heavy on this front. We have to partner. So we should understand that discovery and lupus is a two-way communication. Our patients are a huge resource. And we should listen to them and have allow them to be advocates, educators, and, and researchers. So Dr. Uh, Jillian Rose does lupus line to this end. And we have to diversify. We have to focus on recruitment, equity, inclusion for diverse rheumatology providers across the field. So that's in clinical care and also research. And I'm highlighting Dr. Grace Wright, who does quite a lot of this uh, with the AWEA group. Okay, and so with that, I thank you. We have just a couple of minutes for questions. I'm sorry, that was a little bit long. That was wonderful. Uh, you're eye-opening on so many topics. There's so much information here to digest. And I think 
it's really important for us to bring the forum like this so that we can talk together. So I really appreciate your time here. Um, but I do, I was trying to see in the chat rooms if we have any questions and um, we had a couple questions already pre-submitted. And so one of them that I want to just touch base upon is, you know, lupus is one of the many different diseases that disproportionately affects minorities. What is, in your opinion, the single biggest obstacle to overcome in order to create a more balanced health population across the United States? You kind of touched base upon that. It was really powerful. So I really wanted to hit home with that question. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think the single most important thing is to understand that this is structural. I think a lot of times when we think about racism and disparities, it's a very sensitive topic and people start feeling um, either guilty or defensive or, you know, they, like it's, it's hard for people to engage with this topic because it's something that is emotionally charged on all sides. And I think um, understanding that this is a predicament that we are all in, you know, we can't all be healthy until we're all healthy. Um, and being able to put aside those emotions and look at the structure of this problem will allow us to make strides in really um, changing the game here. Thank you. Um, you did mention a little bit on Tuskegee and uh, you know we've heard a lot about the Tuskegee and disparities during COVID pandemic. It definitely came back out um, talking about it again. How do non-minorities help encourage the minorities to trust the medical system to help support, support their health? Or is there even a possible solution because there's such major biasms in healthcare? Yeah, yeah. So I think the best way is to acknowledge the experience and acknowledge that these things are real. You know, we talked a little bit about gaslighting and what gaslighting does is it, it fosters mistrust and it fosters confusion, right? And so I think for non-minority people, being able to listen to the minority experience and being able to acknowledge the minority experience rather than sort of sweeping it under the rug is the first step because then the minority person says, okay, I'm not crazy and I'm not the only one looking out for this. Gotcha. We are running short on time, but something that comes across in our chapter a lot is about talking with physicians. So if a patient uh, feels the medical, medical professional they're working with is not listening to them, how do they make sure about going to get the treatment that they need, that they feel they, they're not getting? So I would say definitely seek care in a center that specializes in lupus and if you feel like you don't have that rapport with your doctor, find another doctor. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with making sure that you have a, um, a, a good alliance with your physician because that's gonna be a matter of life and death for you. So I think a lot of times, especially for um, minorities, you know, we think, oh, well, let's, let's, we got this doctor, let's be grateful and take what we get. But no, if there's not a, if there's not a therapeutic alliance, find one. Yeah, yeah. So keep seeking it out. Um, thank you for that. And you mentioned a lot of great studies that are coming about, and we saw a lot of people paying attention to this very serious topic. Um, are you? Are there studies results available out there that document specific approaches which will improve the communication between healthcare providers and minority patients, and thus improving the overall outcomes for the patient? For sure, yeah. So, so Emory, so um, Sam Lim's group at Emory, and then also Northwestern with Ros Ramsey Goldman and uh, Harvard with uh, Candace Feldman. So, all of those groups are doing fantastic work in this area. And so, I, I would encourage anyone to take a look there and then take a look at those websites because their centers of excellence have some good resources. Great, great. Um, a couple questions coming in online is, uh, will your slides be able to be shared or viewed? And you did send them over to us. Is it okay if we share it with our with our group here tonight? Of course, you're, you're more than welcome to share them. Thank you so much for letting us share. Um, I'm just trying to comb through and see if there's any questions. And of course, I'm having difficulty looking in the questions section. Um, and we are running short on time, but let me see if I can 
just pull up some more here. Uh, one more question here. Do we know if better outcomes for minority patients exist if lupus um, patients is located geographically near academically medical institutions like access to care? Yes, yes. Access to care definitely matters for lupus outcomes. It matters for time to diagnosis. It matters for time for screening for lupus nephritis and also for treating lupus nephritis. So for sure, being able to access care at a skilled center matters quite a bit for outcomes. Great. Well, you're getting lots of praises, lots of valuable information, and I have to agree 100%. Uh, we really feel that just starting by talking about it within our chapter networks can help us address the issues and shine light to something that we can fix and bring down the barriers to, to what we're, we're all facing here. Um, so I appreciate your time, Dr. Blazer, so much. Um, your time yeah. is precious, as is everyone else's. And um, if there's any questions that pop up later on, is it okay if we forward them over to you and see if we can get more feedback? Absolutely. Happy to help. Well, I want to respect everyone's time, and I thank you again for joining us. This was a great presentation and a lot of information um, to just digest, and we will be um, able to post this on a replay if anyone wants to catch it. And uh, I took like two pages of notes here, Dr. <laughs> so thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Thank you for having me. And I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, check in with your local chapters. Um, if, if you guys are needing more information, your local chapters will be able to help you. And I, again, want to thank the Ohio Commission on Minority Health for helping us and um, the Ohio Department of Health for helping us put on this program this evening. So thank you so much, Dr. Blazer, and everyone have a good evening. Have a great evening. Thank you.